It's an honor to be here. I have to say I'm highly intimidated by this crowd. Uh, the last time that I actually spoke in front of a professor uh, of philosophy was at Texas Tech University when I was getting my philosophy degree and I was in front of Dr. Uh, Daniel Nathan and, um, and I was defending my paper and that was no fun whatsoever. So I'm a little intimidated right now. Uh, also, I have Dr. Steiger who's good. also... <laughs> Uh, Dr. Steiger, who also is on our National Board of Advisors. Um, and then there's doctors all across this room. I kept seeing doctor, doctor, doctor across the room. And I'll give you my credentials just a little bit so you kind of understand who I am. Uh, when I was a little kid playing around on the floor, I learned this after my grandfather passed away. I was playing on the floor, and my grandfather used to turn to my mom all the time, and he would say, that one there, I don't think he's going to make it. <laughs> and he wasn't joking. He was telling us he, that's what he really thought. I didn't learn that till after his death, but that's my credentials right there. That's it. Um, I'm the guy that no one thought was going to make it, um, and I'm honored to be with you, you here today. Uh, I, I do run a museum, and history is very important to me. One of my great all-American heroes is a, a guy um, that uh, really is, is someone who is generally not considered to be a hero in the traditional sense. He's not going to, they're not, Marvel's not going to make a character out of him, but it's George Washington, uh, George Washington Carver, and he's one of my all-time American heroes. And if you go to his museum up here in Diamond Grove, and you walk into his museum, you walk in, and you'll see a quote right across the front door, and the quote simply says this, no individual has the right to come into this world and go out of this world without leaving behind distinct and legitimate reasons for having passed through this world. Now, this is a guy who had every disadvantage you and I will never have and was still able to make a dramatic impact and become a national hero. And if he is able to look us in the eye and say no individual has the right to come into this world and go out of this world without leaving behind distinct and legitimate reasons for having passed through this world, then I think we need to listen. And I think we need to understand that each one of us is put on this earth to leave behind distinct and legitimate reasons. I think the best way to accomplish that is through a little thing called integrity. Integrity. So I want to talk to you just a little bit about that and kind of what I would share if I were to come onto your campus. If you come down to Hobart, Oklahoma, and you walk into our museum, one of the very first exhibits that you'll see of General Frank's life is often overlooked by the, by the average visitor. They'll come in and think, what is that doing there, and move on. It's an old Nicholson wood saw. And this old Nicholson wood saw is sitting there, and it was General Frank's father's saw. And it's sitting there because it was the utility, the, the tool that was used to first teach General Franks his very first major uh, lesson in leadership. And when General Franks, long before he was a general, was young Tommy Franks, he, like most boys, would run around with his dad when his dad was working on the farm. And his dad was working on a barn this day. And he would take that Nicholson wood saw, cut a board, take it up, put it on the, on the barn, come back down and get another board and cut it and put it on the barn. And young Tommy was running around watching his dad and he saw what his dad was doing. He's like, man, I want to be like dad. So he walks over there and he picks up the saw and he grabs the saw and he tries to push it through a piece of wood. Now, if you've ever used a hand saw, you know what happens. There's only two things that happen when you pick up a saw and try and push it through wood. You either bend the blade or you hurt your shoulder. So uh, General Franks, his dad was looking over there, and he sees what Tommy's doing. He looks over there, and he looks at his son. He says, son, son, let me show you how to do that. First, you have to pull, and then you push. You pull, and then you push, and you pull with the same intensity that you push with. If you've ever used a handsaw, you know that's true. You have to pull first, and then you have to push. But General Franks, uh, his father went on to share with him that that's not only true of hand saws, but that's also true of leadership. Great leaders, extraordinary leaders, are those individuals who pull people to them first before they push them to be the best, and here's the key, the best person that they can be. Not the best you want them to be, not the best that, that it would be good for the organization, but to be the very best person that they can be. Now, that was General Frank's first major leadership lesson. And it's completely contradictory to what, a lot of what we see in the world today. What we see in the world today, when you look at Washington, when you look in the corporate world, you see people who are pushing other people around trying to get what they want out of life, trying to get what they want out of their organization, trying to get what they want out of the government. But great leaders are those individuals who pull people to them first. And how they pull people to them? They pull people to them first through character, through their ability to communicate, using that communication to surround people around a common vision, and then here's the key, truly caring about the individuals that are around them. It's what we call at the General Franks Leadership Institute Museum the four stars of leadership.
And that's what, we che- that's what we teach, that's what we communicate, but we teach it from the standpoint of integrity. Now, it's not a new leadership style. Uh, a good friend of mine who's passed away not too long ago, Zig Ziglar, used to say it like this, I believe you can get anything you want out of life if you'll help enough other people get what they want out of life. Martin Luther King Jr. said it like this, I believe that every man can lead because every man can serve his fellow man. The good book says it like this, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. It's the idea of servant leadership, investing in the lives of others, and in helping them accomplish their goals it enables you to accomplish your goals. And that servant leadership is that model that we teach, and we teach it from the lens of integrity. And so I'm going to spend my little bit of time, normally I would present for much longer than this, so we're, I'm going to spend my little bit of time really talking about integrity because I think it's a, a key component. Um, uh, the, the reality is, is that when you look at surveys uh, across the board, whether it's in schools, whether it's in businesses, whether it's in any industry that you want to look at, the number one thing that employees are looking for from their leaders, the number one thing that employees are looking for from their bosses is this, integrity. Over and over on surveys, it comes up as the number one thing that people are looking for in their boss, integrity. They want their boss to be a person of integrity. Now, here's the interesting thing about integrity. If I were to go around the room and ask you to define integrity, we would have as many definitions of integrity as there are tables and maybe even individuals that are in this room. It's one of those words that we as adults throw out there and we say, you need to have integrity. You need to have more integrity. That doesn't show very good integrity. Yet very few of us can really define the word and what that word really means. For each one of us, it means something different. I want to give you a definition of integrity that we use that I think really captures the whole meaning of the word. Now, the best example that I can give to you, the best definition, actually comes from a movie. Now, it's a movie that very few people have seen. It didn't get a lot of play, but it's a great little movie. It's called Joshua. And the movie looks at what it might look like if Jesus were to come back and walk on earth in a small town as a carpenter. Now, we're not going to go down the religious road today, but it has a beautiful picture of integrity. Because what it shows is it shows Joshua when he comes in this town and he starts working, he starts interacting with the people that are around him. And as he's interacting with these people, he begins impacting their lives. Well, there's a young woman who uh, uh, lost her husband at a very young age because uh, of sickness. And she feels like she's been cheated out of life. She feels abandoned. She feels lonely. There's bitterness. There's rage. There's anger, all of those emotions that well up within her. And so she disconnected herself from the community. Well, Joshua starts interacting with her, and she begins to kind of open up. She begins to really kind of come out of her shell, re-engage with the community. She begins to feel affection from Joshua, but she mistakes it for romantic love. So one day, Joshua's out there working in his shop, working on a chair, and she kind of comes over and nuzzles up next to him, and they're kind of talking back and forth. And when she thinks the moment is right, she reaches up to give him a kiss. And he steps back and he says, no, no, you've misunderstood. I came that your life may be better. Well, once again, she feels that anger. She feels that rage. She feels all of those things that well up within her. And as all those things are welling up within her, she looks at him and she says, my life? My life? And she reaches over and she pulls a glass vase off the top shelf. She goes, this, this is my life. And she throws it down and it shatters into thousands of pieces of broken glass. And she points at it and she says, that, that is my life. And she storms out of the barn. I love the next scene. In the very next scene, he, Joshua has left town, but he left a gift for this young lady. And she's sitting with the priest, and he's sitting there, and he reaches back, and he says, Joshua had left you a gift before he left. And he pulls out this beautiful figurine of a dancing woman made out of thousands of pieces of broken glass. Immediately, tears begin to come down her, her cheek, and, and the priest responding to the emotion he sees in her says, I know, I know. It's amazing he can make something so beautiful out of broken glass. And she stops him and says, no, no, no. Not something beautiful. Something whole. Something whole. That is integrity. Now, let me take you back to junior high math class. How excited are you right now? We had some CPAs, so you'll probably get this wrong. Um, back in junior high math class, you learned a word. You learned a word. And this, the word that you learned was integer. Integer. Remember that word? What is an integer? I won't make you answer, but an integer is any whole number. It's any whole number, any number that's undivided. Now listen to the words. Integer. Integrity. When you add the T-Y, it it literally means the state of. So integrity is literally the state of being an integer, a whole number, 
a whole number. That's what integrity means, is that you are a whole person. Now, why is that so valued in our society? It's valued in our society because if I come over here and I start talking to James, and I tell James what an extraordinary person he is, and, and I just have been, it's been great to meet you. I've just been honored to be a, uh, just a part of your life, even for just a brief moment. And then I walk over here and I talk to uh, Dr. Stephen over here, and I talk to Dr. Stephen about James. James wants to know that what I say to Dr. Stephen is the exact same thing that I said to his face, that I don't change, that I'm the same in every situation. That's integrity. That's why we value it so much in our, in our businesses, in our families, in, in our workplaces, in our churches, is because we want to know that when you are looking at me face to face, you are seeing the same person. So if you see me here today, and then you come over to Hobart and you see me at the museum, and then you come back here to Oklahoma Christian University where my daughter's playing basketball, which she'll be starting soon, so come back and watch the games. And you see me, and you see me at the basketball games yelling at the referees, and then you go out, yes, I will yell at the refs, I'm sorry. Um, and, then, uh, and then you go and you see me hanging out with my friends on Friday night, the question is, do you see the same person in every situation or do I change from place to place to place? If you see me changing from place to place to place, you are seeing a lack of integrity. Integrity is extremely difficult to accomplish in our world today. Why? Because we have so compartmentalized our lives that I become a person at work and then I become a completely different person at home and then I go to church and, Heidi, brother, how are you doing? Just fine. No problems here and become a completely different person at church. We change from every single situation. That's where our lack of integrity comes in. Here's the extraordinary thing. Here's the extraordinary thing. And here's what I've got to watch my time. Here's the extraordinary thing that I want you to understand. Do you realize that you are the only you that will ever walk this earth? You are the only you that will ever walk this earth. There's never been another you before you. There will never be another you after you. You are the only you that will ever walk this earth. I went into Red Robin restaurant. And I picked up a coaster, you know, they had little sayings on them. And I picked up the coaster and it said, remember, you're unique, just like everyone else. <laughs> it's funny, but it's true. You are truly the only individual that will ever walk this earth that is you. Now, what does that mean? That means if you're sitting there right now and you've been listening to me for about 10 minutes now and you're sitting there thinking, man, I would give anything to be like that guy up there. First of all, you need higher goals. Second of all, if you were sitting there and you were thinking that, and you were thinking that, and let's say you dedicated the rest of your life to emulating me and being just like me, do you know what the best that you could hope for is? To be a second-rate me. Because you can never be me. All you could be is a second-rate me, but here's the tragedy. The tragedy is the entire world would miss out on a unique expression of humanity it would never, ever again see in anyone else. Your power is being you. And here's why that's important, and here's where it goes back to being normal. Before I came to work with General Franks, I was a minister for 19 years. And I would do counseling. And everyone would come into counseling, and they would share with you their problems, and then they would come down to this point, and they would throw themselves down. they say, Warren, I just want to be normal for a change. Normal? Who came up with that goal? <laughs> to be normal. But you think about it. Think about your life. Think about how many times you've thought that yourself. Think about how many people you've talked to that their entire life goal is to be normal. The reality is, is that 70% that, that of people in America today hate their job. Not dislike, not are discomfortable. Hate. We'll use that word. Hate their job. That everyone is looking for. The number one thing they say they're looking for is a person of integrity. What does that mean? It means that we have a whole lot of bad bosses that have no integrity. That's the norm. That's normal. Normal in our world today is a world where we push people around to try and get what we want rather than pull people to us and encourage them to be the best person they can be. Normal is a lack of integrity instead of having a people of integrity. Normal is individuals who are hating their job because they are in a poor work environment. Don't ever try to be normal. You will succeed and you will be miserable. You will succeed and you will be miserable. I do not believe that we were called to be normal. I believe that we were called to discover the extraordinary person that we were created to be. And that's my passion. My passion is to invest in the lives of other people and to share with them how they, through understanding integrity, through understanding ethical uh, business practices, how they can change the corporate culture that is there. Embrace the integrity of who they are as an individual and find the power in that to change their culture and make it a place where the normal is not anyone's goal, but everyone is striving towards the extraordinary. Because I believe with all my heart that greatness doesn't just happen. 
It has to be chosen. Therefore, make a choice and go be great. Thank you.